I have referenced 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 through, 6, uh, 3 through 6, many times on Sunday mornings, and on many occasions I've actually summarized it, but I've never preached through this text from beginning to end, verses 3 through 6. And seeing that it is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, and we've not yet started a new series, I want to take the time this morning to walk us through this text and find the treasures that lie in it. And 2 Corinthians, Paul has been talking about the greatness of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the new covenant. And many people would say, well, wait a minute, Paul, if your gospel is so great, then why are there those that don't believe it? If your gospel is so wonderful, why are there people who reject it? Verses 3 through 6 is is at least in part Paul's answering to that unstated question. It's Paul answering the question, if the gospel's so great, why do people not believe it? And how do people go from not believing it to believe it? Paul is going to to explain that when people do not believe the gospel, the problem is the blind mind of the unbeliever and not the gospel. The sun does not cease to be the sun even though the blind man cannot see it. Or as C.S. Lewis wrote, a man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of a cell. Then after answering that question of of why some people don't believe, he's going to then move on to explain how the blindness is removed. What comes with spiritual sight, namely the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So let's read these verses and then we will work through them and look at the treasures that are in here. Verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the lights of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's pray and then we'll look at this text. Lord, I come to you and I ask you that you would be with us here in these next few moments. There is a lot in this text and there is a lot we want to understand and grasp and comprehend. We want our understanding of what you have done for us to grow. We want our love for you, our affections for you to be stirred Lord, if there is anyone here whose mind is blind to seeing you as you properly should be seen, I pray that you would say, let there be light this morning in their hearts and in their minds and that you would change them. Bring them in as your children and save them, Jesus. For your glory and in your name we pray, amen. Paul starts off in verse 3 by saying, and even if our gospel is veiled. Now this is a very interesting phrase. And I want to take a look at it. Even if our gospel is veiled. What is he referring to? What does he mean? Why is he using this language of being veiled? 
Now, another place that we see this language is actually in the Old Testament. This language of, of God being veiled from people or the glory of God being veiled from people. It's all the way back in Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 through 35. And if you remember what happens, Moses has gone up on the mountain and he's, he's received uh, the Ten Commandments and he has asked God, God, can I see your glory? And of course, God says, well, I can't show you all my glory because if I show you all my glory, you die. You can't handle that. He says, so what I'll do is I'll pass by. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll pass by. And when I pass by, I'll let you see my back. He says, I'll let you see my goodness. And Moses comes down off of that mountain after seeing just one aspect of the glory of God and his face is glowing. And Moses puts on that veil to hide the glory of God from people seeing it. And here Paul is saying that there are those in his world and in our world today to whom the gospel is failed. Just like Moses, the glory of Moses' face, the glory of God on Moses' face was veiled from the children of Israel being able to see it, so too in our day the glory of Jesus Christ is veiled from people being able to see it. There are those that cannot see the glory of God in the gospel. Now, who are these people? Who are these people in our day and in Paul's day that cannot see the glory of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ that, that is veiled to them? Well, he answers it by saying those that are perishing. Those people who reject the gospel, those people who do not believe the gospel, those people who are dead in their sin and are headed to eternal doom, those people cannot see the gospel. They can't see it. It's veiled to them. There's a veil that doesn't allow them to see the gospel. Now the question is, how does the gospel get veiled to those who are perishing? If the gospel is veiled, how did it get this way? How, how are people unable to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? And I believe the answer to this is twofold. One is not mentioned here. I'm going to talk about it just for a minute. The second one is mentioned here, and we'll look at it as well. But here's, here's the first reason why the gospel is veiled. The first reason why those who are perishing cannot see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It is because of their own fallen condition. It is because they naturally reject the gospel. Listen to that carefully. Because of their natural fallen condition, they reject the gospel. Human beings, we are born into sin. We are born being sinners. We are born in a fallen state. And, and we, we do not see God or His gospel properly. It is veiled to us. We, we do not see it. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The natural man cannot discern spiritual things because they are spiritually discerned. So the natural man whose spirit is not alive cannot see spiritual things. They do not understand spiritual things. John 3, 19, Jesus says, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So the first reason why people cannot see the gospel is because of their own fallen condition. But Paul is going to give another reason here. He says in verse 2, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. What does that mean? What does it mean that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers? The, world, the word world here refers to this sinful, fallen age, this sinful, fallen system. He's not talking about the planet Earth. He's talking to, to, uh, about this fallen system we live in, this fallen age, this worldly system that we live in. And the God of this world here is probably Satan. It's not explicitly said, but uh, even though it's not mentioned, there are some good reasons to believe this is Satan. First of all, this is very similar to Jesus using the language of the ruler of this world being Satan in John 12, John 14, and John 16. 
Here he's referencing Satan, and he calls Satan the ruler of this world. So it's probably good to understand this as Satan. Plus, Jesus is the one, or God's the one that's going to unblind believers, so we shouldn't be thinking this is God because he's not the one that blinds them. So this is Satan here. Satan is the God of this world, the God of this worldly fallen system. Okay? People sometimes get this confused, and I've, I've had people ask me the question, wait, wait, I thought Jesus, I thought God was the God of this world. I thought he's in, char- in charge of all things. I thought he's sovereign of all, over all things. Why in the world are, is Paul saying that Satan is the God of this world? Remember, he's not talking about the planet Earth. He's talking about the fallen worldly system. Who's the one who is in charge of that? Well, it's Satan. Now, he's under the sovereign reign of God, but he's the one, he's the head of this fallen worldly system. And the God of this fallen worldly system has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So people do not see the gospel for two reasons. One, their own fallen state, their natural fallen state as sinners. And two, because Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Now, what does Satan want to keep them from seeing? What is it that Satan wants to keep people from seeing? Paul says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Now, when I read this, there is a word that jumps out at me. It says, the God of this world has blinded the what? The minds. He doesn't say he's blinded the eyes. He says that the the God of this world, that Satan has blinded the minds. Now, this is important. This tells us that there are different kinds of seeing, right? There's different kinds of seeing that people have. And Satan wants to blind a certain kind of seeing in human beings. There is bodily seeing with your your eyeballs that allows you to look at the text and read the chapters. Does Satan, is Satan attempting to blind you from that? No. Satan knows the Bible. Satan quoted the Bible to Jesus. So so he's not trying to blind people from reading with their eyes. Another kind of seeing is an intellectual seeing. This means to discover its sense and discern its meaning. I don't even think that's what it's talking about here. Here, I think he's talking about a spiritual seeing. A a seeing which means to understand the significance of a thing. This is the seeing that embraces the gospel. A spiritual seeing that embraces the gospel. You understand, you see the significance of a thing. Something that is true and you embrace that truth because you see it. That is what Satan is is trying to blind the world from seeing. Satan is blinding those that are perishing from seeing and discovering the moral significance of the gospel. When Paul uses the term mind here, he's not just talking about the physical brain. That's not what the Bible means when it speaks of the mind. This is about reasoning. It's about making judgments. It's about apprehending truth. So let me ask another question. How does Satan blind people from from seeing the truth? How does Satan blind people from seeing Jesus as the truth? Satan has created a system in the world that appeals to the sinful mind. So that sinful people see things that are not worthy as being of ultimate worth. Follow me here. Satan has created a system, this worldly system, where people see things that are unworthy as being things that are of ultimate worth. He puts at the fingertips of human beings... Things that are not of ultimate worth so that we become blind 
to things that are of ultimate worth. We become enchanted by things that we shouldn't be enchanted by, and therefore we don't think straight. So here's what Satan does. Here's how he blinds the minds of unbelievers. He has created a system. He has created a world whereby he puts at the fingertips of human beings things that do not satisfy, things that you shouldn't treasure, things that you shouldn't find your ultimate worth in. And guess what people do with those things? They make them their life. And they stop seeing as they should see. They do not think straight. So they go after the things of this worldly system that cannot satisfy, that cannot fulfill. And they chase after those things and they long after those things and they love those things and it ruins them. And that keeps them from seeing the reality which is Jesus as the greatest treasure. So that's how Satan blinds the minds of unbelievers. He doesn't blind your physical eyes. He doesn't blind your ability to think. What he wants to do is he's wanted, he wants to distort your spiritual thinking so that you think things that are unworthy are worthy. And things that are less than, you see them as the greatest thing. There's a great example of this by the greatest extra-biblical author ever to write, J.R.R. R. Tolkien. If you disagree with that, you're in rebellion to God. Um, if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings or you've ever read Lord of the Rings or you've ever heard anything about Lord of the Rings, you know there's a creature named Gollum. His name is Gollum because when he coughs, he coughs with a Gollum in his throat. Gollum! That's how he got his name. That's not his real name. His real name is Smeagol. He was a river folk creature, kind of like a hobbit. And one day, he is fishing with his friend, Deagle. And Deagle finds a ring at the bottom of the river. And he pulls that ring up, which we know is a magical ring created by a dark force. Of dark force. And he pulls that ring up, and he's, he wants to keep it. Deagle wants to keep it. Well, Smeagol says, well, it's my birthday. You should let me have it. And Deagle says, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm the one that found it. Uh, it's mine. And Smeagol says, but it's my birthday. Let me have it. And he kills his best friend for this ring. Chokes him to death. And he takes that ring, and as he's looking at it, he cleans the dirt off of it, and he calls it my precious. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, he goes and lives in a cave, wanting nothing more than to protect his precious. The thing that he sees as of ultimate worth, and all the while it is turning him from a river folk creature to something unrecognizable, to Gollum. And all Gollum wants is his precious. That is an illustration Tolkien put in on purpose to show how evil works. When we embrace evil as the thing of infinite value, it, it doesn't allow us to see properly anymore. And we become devoted to something as a precious that should never be our precious. That is how the God of this world blinds people. He gives them stuff that they see as precious. And they devote themselves to it. And they become blind to the real reality of Jesus. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the gospel is foolishness to those that are perishing. Because they look at the gospel and they don't see it as a treasure. And they look at the things of the world and they see it as a treasure. Now, what specifically does Satan want someone to miss? What specifically does he want them to be blind to? Paul says, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. 
It says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world had blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. He wants to keep people from seeing Jesus as the glory and the treasure as an image of God. He wants to keep people from seeing that God manifests His glory in Jesus. That when you look at Jesus, you see the glory of God. That's what He wants people keep people from seeing. He wants people to find their glory in something else, not Jesus. Charles Hodge says, The glory of Christ is the sum of all the divine human excellence which censored in his person and makes the radiant creatures the object of supreme admiration, adoration, and love to all intellectual beings and especially to the saints. That the glory of Christ is the sum of all divine and human excellencies. You see, the devil doesn't care if you see the gospel with bodily eyes. He doesn't care if you read about what Jesus says about the gospel. He doesn't even care about your intellectual eyes. There's a lot of intellectual people that reject the gospel. What he cares about is the the spiritual eyes. He doesn't want you to be captured by the light of the gospel. He doesn't want you to be saved by the light of the gospel. So if he can keep you blinded with spiritual blindness to the things of of Christ, then you'll find your glory in something else. Because he knows to see, this is careful, to see this way is to believe. This is pivotal for the rest of the text. To see this way is to believe. If you see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, you get saved. You can't see Jesus as the glory of God and not be saved. So what Satan wants to do is blind you from seeing that light because that light saves you. He wants you chasing after lesser lights. So here's the problem. The problem is that people are blind and they cannot see Jesus as the glory of God and be saved. Now that is the diagnosis. That is the problem. And now Paul turns to the remedy. The remedy for Paul is not to make much of Paul. The remedy for Paul is not to make much of himself. This is what his opponents are doing. These are what false teachers are doing. This is what people who call themselves pastors all over the world still do. There are false pastors and false teachers who are using their churches to make much of themselves. Paul says, it's not what I want to do. Here's what Paul wants to do. He says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves. You're not going to see the light of Jesus by thinking Paul is great. Paul understood that if you want to get spiritually blind people to follow you, you can make it about you and they'll follow you. You can commend yourself and you can puff yourself up and you can make yourself enticing and you can get spiritually blind people to think you're great. It's not what Paul wants. Paul doesn't want to end up preaching himself, preaching to design to attract people to him, the love of man. That's not what Paul wants. That's what Paul's opponents were doing. That's not what Paul wants. That doesn't actually move anybody from being spiritually blind to being spiritually alive. It's like going to a physically blind person, wearing bright colored clothes, dancing around and hoping that you impress them and make them feel better. They can't see that because they're blind. They don't care. Paul is having none of this. He cares for the people that he's ministering to. He calls himself their servant. Look at that. Look at what Paul says. Paul says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves 
Then he says, with ourselves as your servants. Paul's not there to make himself look great. Paul's not there for the, to get people to think that Paul is wonderful or to make much of Paul. Paul says, I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as a servant to people. I want them to think Jesus is great, not me. Paul does not proclaim himself, but he proclaims something that will actually help spiritually blind people. Jesus Christ as Lord. His purpose for preaching so that people will see Jesus. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So Paul knows the only thing I'm here to do is to point Jesus, to point people to Jesus who can actually heal their blindness. They won't be healed by making much of me. They won't be healed by making much of a local congregation either. You know that people aren't going to get saved because they think Calvary Hill is great. Because we got the best auditorium and we got the best technology and we got the best building and we got the best parking lot and we got the best landscaping outside and of course, we, we want it to look nice, but nobody's going to drive by Calvary Hill or walk in this room and go, you know what? I don't want to be spiritually blind anymore because of those chairs. No one is going to come to Christ because they think much of us. That's not the message. That's not why we're here. That's why we're not in competition with any church down the road. You know churches are in competition with each other all the time. They fight to get people's attention, to get them in the pews. And I'm not speaking for everybody, but I think some people, some pastors want people in the pews so the pastors can feel better about themselves. I want these pews packed to feel better about me. I'm doing a good job if I'm growing this church. I'm doing a good job. I want people to think I'm a good pastor. I want people to think that I'm doing the good job. And I want people to think that I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and us, and we, and us, and we, and I'm. And what are we missing? The only thing that can actually heal blind people. Jesus. Now, did Paul work as hard as he can? Sure. Do we work as hard as we can to get people in here and to, to grow the church and to do what God's... Absolutely we do. But we get them here not so they can think much of us. We get them here so they can think much of Jesus. So that they can see Christ in us. We don't commend ourselves to people. We commend Christ. Paul knew the only hope for those who were blind is for them to hear about Jesus. So that's what he proclaims. Now, Paul knows just because he preaches it doesn't mean they're going to believe it, right? I mean, you can get people to, to hear you preach all day long. They may, they may be able to read with their physical eyes. They may be able to intellectually agree with you or intellectually engage with you, but that doesn't mean they're going to accept Christ. That doesn't mean they're going to believe Jesus Christ as Lord, that doesn't mean they're going to be healed of their spiritual blindness. It's not like we can use some special formula, preach in a certain way, say some, some exact words like some Harry Potter spell and get you to believe. No, it's actually even more impressive than that. In order for someone to get healed of spiritual blindness, God must do something that only God can do. He must do something of his own sovereign choice that no one can make him do. And in order to demonstrate this, Paul is actually going to take readers back to Genesis chapter 1. Look at what Paul says here as he takes us back. He wants your mind to go back. Verse 6. For God, who said, let light Shine out of darkness. 
Genesis 1, 2 and 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. This is where Paul wants our minds to go. How did God bring light? He spoke it, and it was created. One moment there was darkness, the next moment there was light. It is all a work of God. Paul knows that God uses the preaching to save people, but if God does not create the spiritual sight, nobody gets saved. I can preach till I'm blue in the face. Brother James can preach till he's blue in the face. We can preach the greatest message that humankind has ever heard. We could make Billy Graham and and Jonathan Edwards look ridiculous and silly with the great messages that we preach. But if God does not say, let there be light in a person's heart, no one will get saved. Doesn't matter how great the message is. No one will get saved. We preach Jesus Christ as Lord, but Paul knows that is not simply enough. Something else must happen. And notice what happens. The God who said, let there be light, listen to this, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If anybody is going to get saved, God must say in their hearts, let there be light. If not... They stay blind. If anyone is going to see Jesus as they should see Jesus, God must say, let there be light. And when God says, let there be light, it is not as if the light can say no. Think, think, think about the, the train of thought here that Paul is giving. In the beginning, when God said, let there be light, could darkness go not going to let that happen. What, happens when, what happened when God said, let there be light in Genesis 1? There was light. The darkness had no more say-so. When that's, so that's the example he's giving. Are you with me? Then he says, in the same manner... When God comes to the dark heart, the rebellious heart, the wicked heart, the blind mind that only sees this world as a treasure, they are walking around in darkness. When God says, let there be light in their hearts, guess what happens? There is light in their heart. They see. The darkness doesn't get to say, let me just fight a little bit harder and hold you off. It's not what happens. When people, when God says, let there be light in someone's heart, people see Jesus for who he is. And you are saved. Now, how does God do this? Well, he does this through regeneration. It's what we call the new birth. He doesn't audibly say, let there be light. What he does is he sends the spirit to bring that person to spiritual life through regeneration, being born again. This is done through the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I say when God says let there be light, that there is light and that person is saved is because of what happens to them, what they see. Look at what they see at the end of verse 6. He says, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give So what happens when the Holy Spirit comes at regeneration? What happens when God says, let there be light? What does a person see? See, I'm arguing that the text is saying, the moment God says, let there be light, you are saved. That's what I'm arguing. The moment God says, let there be light, you are saved. And the reason why I believe that is because what you see when he says, let there be light. You with me? Let me say it one more time. I'm arguing that you are blind because of your natural condition. You are blind because Satan has blinded you by causing you to want to love other things. But God says, let there be light, and he shines that light in your heart, 
and He shines that light, you get saved. Because what you see, and here's what He sees, the light, here's the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When a person hears the gospel, they may hear words and not think much about it. They may hear words and think about those words, but, do not, but not delight in them and see Jesus as a treasure. But when a person has God say, let there be light in their heart, they are given the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You cannot see the glory of God as Jesus and not be saved. It's what it means to be saved. When you see the glory of God in the man Jesus Christ, you are a Christian. So when God says, let there be light, and the Holy Spirit comes and regenerates your hearts and and lights up that spiritual dead condition and that spiritual blind condition, when that happens, you see. And when you see, you see Jesus as the glory of God, and you are saved. There's no seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and not getting saved. I'm arguing here that this is a sovereign work of God that no, no, no matter how much we preach, it doesn't change it. It doesn't fix it. Only God can do that. This light means you don't see Jesus as just some historical figure from the past. You do not see him as just some good man who taught some great stuff and started a religion and that we should model our lives after him. No, we see him with this light through the prism of the Holy Spirit and being born again. You see him as the very glory of God manifested. And when you see that, you're saved. And now you treasure something you didn't treasure before. You delight in something you didn't delight in before. You love something you didn't love before. You see Jesus as beautiful, as the greatest treasure in the universe, and in comparison to everything else that you used to think was glorious, it's a match to the sun. That is why we say around here, there are only two kinds of people in this world. Those who are blind to the treasure that is Jesus. And they are finding their precious in something else. And it will distort you and unshape you and unmake you And you will become more and more less human. Or there are people whom God in His grace has said, let there be light. And the Holy Spirit of God has brought life to your spirit, gave you a heart of flesh instead of a stony heart, and renewed your spiritual being. And now, the thing that you used to think was precious that is going to distort you and unmake you, you leave behind for the greatest precious treasure in the universe, Jesus, who is making you more and more and more and more like Him, which is to say, making you more human. If Jesus is the most human anybody's ever been, and that's how we want to look, we need to become more human. The more you love Jesus, the more you act like the human being you were created to be. Which means in this room, there are only two kinds of people. There are those who see Jesus as the greatest treasure in the universe and are running after him and following him are those who are blind to it. There's only two kinds of people watching this message. It's 
If you are one of those who have, who have never said, I want to repent. I need to turn. I need Jesus. I want to cling to him as the, as the, the treasure and the most precious thing in my life. If you've never done that, then you're blind. And I'm commanding you in the name of Jesus to see this morning. See. I'm asking the Spirit of God to open up your spiritual eyes to believe. And we do what we do around here to lead people to walk in this newness of life. And if you have any question about whether you are blind or not, then come grab us after the service. Come talk to Brother James. Come talk to me. If you're a lady and you'd rather speak with a lady, we've got ladies that can do that as well. Do not leave here not knowing for sure whether or not you can see. If you're watching this at home, reach out to us. Reach out to the office this week. Call us. Say, I I need to talk to somebody about my my spiritual condition. And here's, this is not part of the text that I wanted to preach on today, but look at what it says in verse 7. We have this treasure. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Neil, you've already used the word treasure. You think, I wasn't just making that up. I I like the word treasure. Let's use it. I was using it because of what verse 7 says. What is the treasure? The treasure is seeing Jesus as the glory of God. We have this treasure. We have this gospel. In what? Jars of clay. Why? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. We get this gospel and we are changed and we believe and we become more like Jesus in these jars of clay that we live in so that Jesus looks great. To show his surpassing power, not ours. So I'm done. It's crazy to me how there's all those prepositional phrases. You notice that? It's almost like you can't, it's like to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God and the fam- Four prepositional phrases right there. You could do a whole series on these four verses real quick. Reach out to us. Come find us at the end of this service. There is only one person that can make you unblind. There's only one person, and I promise you, if you do not turn to him, you will get, you will be made undone. You'll be made undone. But with Christ, we we are promised that we will end up in his image, perfectly human one day. Don't leave here blind. Don't spend another week blind. Repent. Turn and see.